Yeah, welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. Um, this series is History is Here to Help. We need to know history. We need to learn history. We need to see how history affects the present and the future. Um, so how history explains Europe's move to the right and what historical factors are now emerging or re-emerging in Europe. And for this discussion, Tim Afficella, my co-host, and uh, Manfred Henningsen, our esteemed guest, uh, who is a uh, uh, emeritus political science professor who served in Manoa for a long time. I, I'm not even going to say how many years, Manfred. 50 so. years. Oh, my God. All right. Thank you for that. <laughs> Tim, let's start with you. The, the, first, the first point is, is, is Europe moving to the right? And what are your reasons for saying that? Uh, yes, I believe Europe is moving to the right. Um, they have been doing so for quite some time. And I, I think a big part of it is um, immigration. And what is the underbelly of immigration? Racism. Uh, you can thank Brexit partially because they didn't want to accept the EU's uh, quota on immigration numbers. Uh, and it's problematic in France because there's a, a large influx of, of Muslim uh, 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 population and socially or uh, culturally that's clashing with the existing French culture. Um, Germany has its issues uh, with the same. Uh, so when you have uh, populations intermixing in, in cultures that are, um, I won't say segregated, but have not had a, a high degree of immigration, um, there's conflicts that are bound to take place. And I think all, all populism, nationalism begins with immigration issues, and that is the ultimate social wedge issue. You know, uh, I was so happy to see Angela Merkel accept um, Middle Eastern migrants when they were having so much trouble in the Middle East. Um, but you know what? Um, what? What you just said and what we know today in retrospect was predictable, wasn't it? Uh, I mean, she was being very high moral bound uh, in leading the, the effort in Germany to accept immigrants. And other countries were following her lead, too. Uh, it was a very noble thing. But wasn't it predictable that this would have a corrosive effect ultimately? I think so. Um, when President Biden came into office, there was outcry about him lifting the numbers of immigrants uh, above and beyond where Donald Trump's numbers were. And I, I think it goes into a fear, a fear of economic insecurities. Um, the old adage, yeah, they're going to take your jobs away. Well, those aren't true. Those, those jobs aren't going to be taken by Americans in the first place. But there is an economic fear factor, and, and it's alive and well. And that fear factor, like all fear, is a great rallying point for populism. Yeah. I don't know why, but this reminds me of uh, Trump's comment, Manfred. Um, you know, uh, well, the comments of some of his followers about how this group or that group would not replace us. You know, we are the white supremacists and this group will not replace us. And, and maybe that's what was going on in, in various countries in Europe when the migrants were heading north and uh, resettling themselves uh, all the way up to the, the top of Scandinavia and to Britain. Um, and so I, I, I ask you, what is, what is the process historically? Um, is this look, something have, that was predictable on a historical basis? Look, I'm a little bit uh, reticent to follow Tim's uh, suggestion that immigration, you know, is the major issue. You have to remember that you have large non ethnic groups in almost all Western European countries, especially the people who had colonies, you know, like France, uh, Holland, Belgium, England. Uh, that was not the issue in Germany. In Germany, you had the guest workers coming in in the, the 60s from uh, Italy, Spain, Turkey, especially Turkey. Mm -hmm. And you have now more than 3 million uh, Turkish Muslims 
living in Germany, half of them uh, are integrated of German citizenship. The other half don't want to apply for it because they lose property rights in Turkey. Uh, so what you have is a somewhat more complicated story. It's not only the recent immigrants. I mean, Angela Merkel uh, asked to keep German borders open in 2015. The reasons for that are not completely clear. She is personally very reticent to talk about uh, motivations for political decisions that will come out maybe in a book next or in two years. But people, I mean, she often talked about her experience as living in the GDR, having no freedoms of movement. And uh, these restrictions uh, played a major role. And there was another one uh, that uh, I think played a role also, and that was this failure of the conference in 1938 that FDR had organized in order to deal with the issue of uh, the Jewish refugees from uh, from Germany and uh, Nazi occupied uh, Austria. And as you will <coughs> know, of the 32 countries that came to this conference, only one was willing to accept refugees, namely the Dominican Republic. All the others refused. And uh, Angela Merkel, you know, is a uh, person who reads a lot of history books uh, and invited when she was chancellor uh, historians to give talks in the chancellery. And I think these two background uh, motivations played a major role in her decision. Now, you have also, I think, to understand that uh, <clears throat> In East Germany, you didn't have much experience of non-ethnic um, Germans. Uh, you had you had uh, workers uh, from Mozambique, from Angola, from Cuba, from North Korea, but they were living in camps. They were not, uh, you know, roaming around as in West Germany, where you had uh, not only the black GIs. But you had uh, three and a half million of them from 1945 to 1990. But you had a lot of students from uh, Africa, from China and other places. So you have, uh, in a way, an ethnic mobility in Germany long before this immigration problem, this recent immigration problem became an issue. Well, it's a question of degree. There were millions of yeah, Middle East migrants, millions of them, they were everywhere. Well, there was a million coming in 2015, but you have a lot of, I mean, look, you had three and a half million Turks in Germany, and you had uh, close to 60,000 German uh, Chinese students. You had uh, and a lot of African students. Now, let me, let me so, ask this question. Was um, her decision and the migrants, the increase in migrants, a part of Germany or that that group in Germany that has moved right, um, did it um, make people move right to see some, all some, these migrants? Some, but not... Would you uh, agree that Germany is moving right? No, it, it's not moving right. And this these Reichsburg people, you know, uh, who want to, re <laughs> you want to restore the Reich, it's not the Third Reich, it is the Second Reich, you know, that was founded in 1871. And there is a very funny uh, German song you can get on YouTube. You know, it's called, Wir wollen unseren alten Kaiser Wilhelm wieder haben. We want to get our old uh, Emperor uh, Wilhelm uh, again. But the one with a long beard, meaning <laughs> it's uh, not Kaiser Wilhelm II, you know, the nut. Uh, who came to power in 8088, uh, but uh, his father. Uh, it's it's all song, about nostalgia. Well, it's, it's, it's in, yes, I mean, it's a part of it. But these, look, the Reichsburger are also people who uh, did not want to accept the legitimacy of the Federal Republic. And they did 
something you know that you had in the United States too in the Northwest you know with refusing paying taxes uh, and you have these anti-tax movements in a way you could say as a in some countries as the beginning of right-wing populism you have it in Scandinavia in Denmark you know Glistrup was a very famous anti-tax uh, activist and he created then uh, strangely enough a party that was called progress, uh, even though it was just the opposite of progress. What what he <laughs> created? Well, it sounds like that's that's sedition. If you reject yeah, the, yeah. Uh, the federal government's uh, no, absolutely, it's yeah. a seditionist movement. I mean, like you have it in the United States, uh, but I mean, look in the United States, you have the background of the Civil War, and as I mentioned the last time in our discussion, you know what is sad about the history of the United States is that people do not remember that the people who were in charge of the sedition in 1861 were not indicted. They were not put before a court. They were is not- it, Is it too late for that now? Because Congress might get around to that. No, I'm only joking. Think, <laughs> no but I think people don't know that, you know, that, these, uh, that Lincoln's successor, I mean, Lincoln was assassinated in April of 65 and his successor, Andrew Johnson, was a southerner, you know, former slave owner. And he, uh, you know, exculpated uh, all of these uh, treasonous people. And Jefferson Davis, the president, you know, was under house arrest for a, f a few years, but he was never indicted. He should have been hanged. And so what happens then, you know, this lost cause uh, made the, the southerners angry and they put up everywhere monuments, you know, with these uh, losers sitting on horseback in parks and at university uh, campuses. And uh, so what you have in the in the United States, you know, is uh, this uh, institutionalization of the lost cause. And uh, we are still in a way suffering from this. Oh, sure. I mean, there are people memory. around that say the Civil War is still going yes. on. Let, right. me, let me shift gears for a minute, Manfred. So we, we saw uh, an attempt uh, to turn the government upside down in Germany. Uh, and what does that represent? Uh, who is doing what and why? And what can we learn from their effort? And what can, we, well, what can we learn from the reaction response of the public and the German government? Look, it is a deranged group led by a deranged leader Heinrich the Thirteenth, you know, a, a prince from Royce, whatever. All of the other family members uh, call him a nut, uh, and he is. I mean, that group is not a neo-Nazi group. It is a resentment group mm -hmm. that, for some strange reason. Uh, feels that the West German constitutional order that came into being in 1949 is an illegitimate imposition by the Allies, the victors of World War II. And for that reason, they want to return to the Reich. Now, the Reich is not the Third Reich, as I said, the but it's, Reich. it's the Reich that came, that collapsed in 1918, you know, when all of, when the Kaiser and all of the other Monarchs in Germany. No, they don't. They don't have the Nazi ideology. Then, uh, they're, they're no. Just... But I mean, they're they're attracting some of the people from uh, the right wing also. So they have not merged. Uh, so they are a group of. I mean, they are a group of disaffected ideological people, and I think they are led by people who are deranged. Okay. Well, let's go. Let's go to others in. Um in Europe. I mean, Hungary, moving right. Uh, Marine Le Pen, you know, made a, um, an interesting showing against Macron. Yes. And we'll, she'll continue to... So, so Tim, you know, tell us what, what it looks like in terms of these various countries, uh, which, which all have indications. You know, as Manfred says, maybe it's, it's just spurious, but it's there. And it keeps on repeating itself uh, across borders. Um, what's the connection and uh, what causes this and what effect does it have and where is it? That's multiple compound, but I, I really, I'm sorry to say this, I enjoy 
asking you multiple compound questions. Yeah, I know that. <laughs> um, I, you know, what's the common denominator? I, 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 I'll kind of stick with what I said initially. I, I think it's uh, the, someone's attempt, and, and I'll call him a wingnut, uh, be it Donald Trump or this, this, um, you know, this Prince the 13th. I mean, the common denominator is a preservation of a culture. And, and the, the audacity of a world leader or my, my country's leader to somehow diminish or um, uh, blemish the culture that we're accustomed to. Uh, by the way, for the record, uh, the best thing that ever happened to England was either through colonialism or just immigration over the last decades. Um, their food has never been better. That is true. I mean, that was, <laughs> thank you, Manford. That, that you was, no, no, you no, measure a was, society by its food, eh? No, yeah, was, oh, absolutely. That food, was a, art, you know, the, what they the, drink. The, the empire. Yeah. <laughs> the bad food. It's true. So, I, I mean, I mean, look, let's not forget and Italy and um, the recent election there. Yeah. And I think a big part of them, again, is this, I won't call it nationalism. I, I, I'll call it cultural preservation. I, let's call it populism. Um, and I think that is the common denominator. That's, that's the entryway. That's, that's the, you know, the camel's nose under the tent. And it goes from there. And then, then it just becomes unadulterated quest for power, which ultimately leads, I think, to fascism. So yeah, populism, but you... populism is dangerous. Uh, populism, is populism good for Europe? No. It's not, not my good opinion. For no. But you see, the Italian case, there is a different dimension also. They have never really processed uh, their history. I mean, in 1943, True. Mussolini becomes uh, removed from office. It was just uh, the reaction of other military leaders to the successful landing of the Allies in Sicily. So from, and then the German hijacked uh, they hijacked Mussolini and put him up in office in northern Italy, where he was then, in the end, uh, captured by the partisans with his mistress, um, sentenced to death and hung by their feet in Milan. You know, from uh, it was really an extraordinary uh, picture. Never escape in a red, a red sports car. <laughs> but that also no. But you see, the interesting thing about. Uh, Italy is that you do not have really uh, the same kind of uh, active uh, confrontation of the record as you have had in Germany in the last since the late 70s or the mid 70s. So for that reason, I always surprised, you know, encounter fascist statues uh, in 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 Italy. Uh, they are and now you know, the. Prime Minister Meloni, she is uh, self-declared neo-fascist, you know. Uh, so uh, you, uh, when you go to Scandinavia, it's different. You know, in Scandinavia, you have uh, this nostalgic notion of a past, you know, that they do not want to let go. They want not to have the euro uh, only Finland has it, but uh, Sweden uh, and Denmark, even though they are part of the European Union, they want don't want to have it. Norway didn't join. They want to keep their monarchies. You know, even though you have these tensions between these three countries, because Sweden was too close to Nazi Germany, the king was a close friend of Hitler, whereas uh, you know the Norwegian king left. Uh, and the Danish king, uh, you know, was obviously not supportive of the Germans when they occupied it in, in April of 1940. But you have within, you know, Scandinavia, these tensions between the Norwegians and uh, the Danes on one side and the, the Swedes on the others. You know, they have not forgiven the Swedes for their collaborationist mentality during World War II. The Finns are different, you know, they were fighting on the German side. Uh, so uh, there are all kinds of complicated historical issues, you know, in Scandinavia when it comes to that. But what 
combines them now is this unwillingness um, to replace their uh, ethnic identity through letting millions of people come in. In Germany, you have now 25, 20% of people having a migrant background. Now, it's not on, always a migrant, migrants from uh, Africa or uh, some of the Middle Eastern countries. Uh, they also come from within the European Union. Um, so you have a lot of, uh, you know, Bulgarians, Romanians, Poles, Hungarians, uh, Czechs, uh, and, you know, uh, over a million Russians. Uh, yeah, I wanted, to, I wanted to talk about that. Um, you know, so Ukraine has, uh, has a, a fair number of migrants, millions coming, a lot, a lot of them right. to Poland, but some of them to other countries, um, you know, in Eastern Europe and moving to the West. And so we have a, a, a mass migration again. Yes. At the same time, we haven't we haven't stopped the migration from the Middle East. That continues. But you know what? What I'm getting is now you got it coming from both sides. And if you weren't irritated with the migrants coming from the south, um, you can be irritated. Some people, I'm sure, uh, will be irritated by the migrants coming from the east. So the whole thing seems to be in flux. And my question to Tim to both of you, is how does that affect the solidarity of the EU? So one thing we know that people you know, react to migrants by trying to return to their ethnic history. Um, but the other thing is uh, we need the coalition now in order to, you know, in order to support Ukraine in, in a war that disturbs the global liberal order. Uh, in a war that, um, you know, uh, undermines the notion of sovereignty. Um, so uh, what effect does all that have um, well, on, on their ability to stay with a coalition? Well, I, the effect, obviously, I, I think, maybe I'm wrong on this opinion, but it was an underlying reason why Brexit vote went the way it did. And that is, again, the concern of taking on immigration quotas uh, from the EU that Britons felt, and they were stoked, um, but Britons felt that um, their society and their cultural uh, you know, um, existence was being um, diminished. No different than I, I think have here right now is a real fear, a uh, white male fear that they're being pushed back in the, uh, the back of the room. You'll hear the term um, white replacement. Uh, these are very, very emotional issues that people don't take uh, for granted. Uh, they're embedded in the human psyche. And when you start threatening people in their cultural existence, uh, be it true or not, and most of it's not true, but uh, it, the right leader, uh, the right demagogue can persuade them that that is the issue of the day. Uh, look, do you, do you look, agree with that, Manfred? No. Well, yes, but no. Uh, both. Uh, Thank yes, you. But no. We've had that before. You know, one of the one of the most fascinating export articles of Denmark uh, to uh, the United Kingdom and the United States is my brother, who's a Scandinavian specialist in Germany, always tells me, and it's not a joke, is male seamen. Uh, you know, they all want to follow up on uh, Trump's. A comment, you know, why can't we get these Norwegians, you know? <laughs> and so <laughs> the semen export uh, is really a booming industry. Oh, uh, God, no. In, yes, oh, in Denmark. <laughs> uh, that's, not a, that's not a joke. Now, uh, I, I... I don't think it was the Norwegian aspect. It was the white aspect of that. <laughs> yes, but that's... No, no it, yes, the white aspect, but was especially pronounced by... Trump's uh, remembrance of, of how Norwegians look. But that's not the issue. You know, I uh, think, uh, you know, Brexit, for example, you always emphasize the, the quota issue. But you see, England had more than 2 million workers from within the European Union. Uh, you know, because of the Schengen Agreement, they could move there. 
Now they are lost and England uh, suddenly realizes, and I say England because it's not Scottish, it's not a Scottish, a Welsh and a Northern Irish problem because they did not uh, vote for uh, the Brexit. Uh, well, at least Northern Ireland and Scotland didn't. They wanted to stay within the European Union. Uh, now, what you are facing in Great Britain today as a result of the Brexit is an economic collapse. Right. Uh, and uh, they do not know how to manage that, you know. Uh, now, that was predictable. But when you are looking, you know, you also have to remember, and Jay is always talking about contemporary immigration. You have to remember that all of these colonial powers, after they abandoned, uh, or I mean, the colonies became independent, a lot of collaborating people moved to the metropolitan societies. I mean, you had that in in France. You had it in 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 certainly in Great Britain. Um, you never had it in Germany because Germany was not long enough a colonial power. Mm -hmm. It ended uh, in World War One. So what you had in Germany, you know, were these guest workers who came in the sixties from European countries initially, and then Turkey. And now, you know, Germany needs every year five hundred thousand immigrants right. in order to keep their uh, level of productivity. Uh, now, Germans, ordinary Germans are not aware of that, or uh, I don't know whether they understand that, but people in power know that. Germans, the German economy will simply collapse if you do not have this input of foreign well, let me Let me just ask this, though. You know, if you have a downturn in the economy, um, that kind of validates the concerns of the people who think that the migrants are a negative feature. It validates their, you know, fear that they, they, they will lose their jobs, they will lose their quality of life, you know, their middle class status, whatever it is. And, and if we have a downturn, for example, in Britain, um, Britain is going to, am I right? Britain is going to move right. So when you have instability in the economy, you have a turn to the right. Isn't that predictable? Yes and no. But remember, the English prime minister now uh, is not a white man. He is a guy with Indian background. I'm now, talking but, about the economy, Manfred. Yeah, if but the I mean, the economy goes uh, down, people tend to track that back to the migrant issue. Huh? Yeah, but uh, Margaret Thatcher got in that way. Yes, but I mean, the interesting thing in England is that you have, despite this downturn, these problems as a result of Brexit, you have now, you could say, a migrant prime minister. So the contradictions, you know, are quite amazing. And they are also fascinating when you're watching the, the, Meg, the Harry and Meghan story. Uh, I mean, the unwillingness of the royal house and the boulevard press, and I would say a lot of people in the society as a whole, they didn't want to accept Megan, you know, this uh, mixed race American woman, uh, because of racism. Uh, I mean, you have not only classism in, in, in England, but you have racism as well. And I'm looking forward, you know, watching tonight, you know, the second part of the the uh, Harry and Meghan story on Netflix, because uh, I found it absolutely fascinating how intelligent these two people are, the way they are talking, you know, they are not nuts. Uh, and it's not simply a kitschy performance. No, it's a very powerful political story and the failure of you know, the, the royal house, you know, after the disaster with Diana, uh, to have the second uh, controversy hit them, you know. This is, uh, not, this is not good. No, uh, it's not good. Britain. It's not good. No. Let, me, let me shift to one other area that we have talked about so often, and that is the connection 
that um, uh, that right wing movements use autocrats or would be autocrats use in order to advance their interests. And that is technology. It is social media. And let me add that, um, you know, Vladimir Putin is using that actively. There was an article a couple of days ago about how Vladimir Putin is trying to divert, divide the, the German the German uh, group, the German people, on the issue of whether they should support um, Ukraine. And his, his, his argument is, is sub, a subterfuge argument uh, that he uses social media to advance is that the Ukrainian refugees in Germany are having this negative effect on Germany, on you know, its social and economic status, and therefore the German people should oppose supporting the war. Okay, and this, the article was in the Times. Uh, look, uh, he it, had done that before. He had done that before. He, he does yeah. that all the time. That's what he does. Yes. But you know, the it thing the work. thing is that, that that when we find it would appear to be a coincidence about movements around Europe that go to the right, um, we find also that those movements are supported, if not fomented, um, by social media, which come from somewhere else. Uh, or which blanket all of Europe. And so we, if you say, as we as we suspect, that Europe is moving to the right, um, then social media and the Internet have to be part of that. Tim, your thoughts? I couldn't agree more. I mean, social media is the vehicle. But what's behind the vehicle? What's in the vehicle? And that is propaganda. Propaganda is the dark art of rhetoric. Um, sorry, but Donald Trump, if you didn't watch him from day one, he's using multiple propaganda techniques that are quite effective. And, and the problem with the United States is, and the media specifically, they weren't well um, armed to understand and recognize propaganda as it was occurring in front of their very eyes. And so um, moving forward, I would appreciate the media to point out propaganda techniques that are being employed right then and there in front of the, the population. Well, they did that in Germany. It came out in the newspaper and, um, you know, and, and, and Vladimir Putin was blamed for it. Manfred, yeah, what are you, your thoughts about this? You, you have a, a, a specific problem in Germany because uh, you have a lot of Russian uh, Russians living there. I mean, you had uh, 300,000 Russian Jews coming in the 90s when Helmut Kohl said, you know, any Russian Jew who wants to come to Germany can do so without a visa. So you have uh, the, the Jewish population in Germany being around 250,000 at this point. Uh, many of the, a lot of them coming from uh, Russia and they uh, are not joining the traditional Jewish communities in Germany. But you have then in addition to that, uh, 1.5 million uh, German Russians, I mean, uh, Germans who were invited by Catherine the Great in the 18th century to settle in Russia, they have come to stay in Germany and they are very often a target of uh, Putin's propaganda. And sometimes, uh, you know, it works. There was a story of, uh, you know, that they used in order to incite uh, all kinds of unrest that a young 15 or 13 year old girl was raped by a group of uh, Middle Eastern immigrants. And uh, that story really made headlines uh, in Russia. Lavrov, the Russian foreign minister, you know, used it. And then it turned out had, that was not happening. What was happening is that this young woman, you know, had Middle Eastern friends and talked with them. Uh, but there was no <laughs> rape uh, involved in the story. But it had become an independent story and worked, you know, emotionally uh, very well for Bruton for some time until they realized he was lying. So <laughs> I, uh, well, that's what he does. He does it in Europe. Yes, he does it he, everywhere. He does it in the United States for elections. Right. Um, right it's like very Trump. troublesome. And, well, remember, and, propaganda is the creation of a whisper of the truth that's been concocted into a big lie. So right. there's always a whisper of, of something that was truthful at the moment. Um, 
maybe the characters were the truth, but nothing else other than that. Yeah, but, you, know, asked, you asked yeah. about the European Union before. Mm -hmm. And I think one very interesting, I mean, one bad thing that happened was this corruption scandal with the vice president of the European Parliament. You know, her father was seen with a suitcase uh, leaving a hotel with, uh, I don't know, 500,000 euros. <laughs> uh, but the other thing that I, the positive thing about the European uh, Union at this point is that they managed to stop giving or or bond money because uh, you know and they had the majority for that which is quite extraordinary and on the other hand Orban did not stop these plans for the re the, the reconstruction of the uh, Ukrainian uh, infrastructure uh, you know the European Parliament passed a resolution that uh, they will do that. And Hungary did not veto that. And Poland didn't veto that either. So those are positive signs that uh, indicate to me that whatever the scandal, you know, of the Greek um, deputy leader of the, the parliament may do to uh, the stability of the European Union, it's the Ursula von der Leyen, you know, the, the president is still, I think, doing a good job. And I wanted and to ask you about that, Manfred, because, you know, the two are, uh, they affect each other. The stability of Europe, which we've been talking about, and the stability of the United States, which we right. haven't talked about. And so the question I put to you, and it's the last question because we're running out of time. Um, the question I put to you is, uh, what, what kind of policy should the United States have in terms of affecting this, of um, you know, somehow, um, re, 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 somehow encouraging, um, somehow, um, somehow preventing, preserving, pre preventing the the move to the right in Europe, and preserving democracy such as it exists. What can we do? You said that uh, Biden doing a good job. What else can he do? What can his successor do? Well, Biden is, I think, doing a good job by uh, supporting the European Union, uh, its uh, political goals, the European Union as such. Trump was against it. You know, he, he didn't want uh, the European Union to succeed. He wanted to promote nationalism. And I mean, he went to uh, he, he was successful in the sense that he he tended to destabilize the EU, didn't he? And yeah, now but it it's a matter work. of recovering from that. It didn't work. Uh, I mean, he yes, he destabilized it by supporting Orban and uh, the the PIS party in in I'm sorry, that's the acronym for uh, the re, the ruling party in Poland. He supported both of them. Uh, because he felt, you know, these are the two countries that are most troublesome for the stability and unity of the European Union. And uh, so he exploited that. Uh, but I do not think he has, he has succeeded. Uh, I think, uh, on the contrary, whatever Trump does when it comes to Europe will unite uh, uh, the European Union and for that reason, you know, I do not think that the European Union is uh, in danger. Um, I mean, there are troubles, uh, but uh, it's not in danger of falling apart. So what, what can we do to preserve it? What can we do to, may I say, reverse the move to the right? By <laughs> getting rid of the right wing threat in this country. <laughs> Well put. Well, well put. <laughs> what a perfect answer. <laughs> okay, we're almost out of time. Tim, why don't you take the the, the anchor on this? And uh, oh, give us your, your I thoughts. agree with Manfred wholeheartedly on his um, his comment here. Um, what can we do? Um, try to pers try to educate all all citizens that immigration isn't a threat to their their sovereignty, if you will to their cultural identity, that 
a lot of positive things do take place when we get different society and cultures uh, enmeshed into our society, our, our current society. Um, so the greatest thing you could do is start educating on the, the values of, of different peoples and population um, and helping them out in, in really dire situations. Yeah, um, it's about um, the United States as the, the city on the hill, the beacon. And uh, if we could be more pure about that, then we could be a global leader on these issues. Well, thank you so much, Manfred. Great to have you on the show. Manfred Henningsen uh, and Tim Apicella, thank you both. Aloha. Thank you. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.